But he was a local hero. <laughs> Do you know he served three terms as mayor of Warsaw after mm. the martyrdom? Wow. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Following the acquittal of the murderers of Joseph and Hiram Smith, what happened to the town of Warsaw, Illinois? Was it a boom town or did it bust? Brian Stutzman will answer that question in our next conversation, and we will find out more about that in just a moment. Now, also talking about Fort Frank Worrell, he was a guard at the jail. We talked about how Joseph was being, he wasn't convicted, he was being held for his own safety and he had visitors come and go. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an interesting story down with Frank Worrell and Thomas Sharp, and that dealt with Dan Jones, okay? You've heard of Dan Jones. Dan Jones was a convert to the church. He was, he was from Wales, and he was south in the St. Louis area, maybe a little further south if, if I have the story right. And he's not a member of the church, and he reads Thomas Sharp's writings about the church. See, back then, they didn't like have the AP wired, so they, the newspapers, there was a series called the Exchange Papers, and you could copy other newspaper articles in your local paper, and they'd exchange things around. So articles that Thomas Sharp wrote in the Warsaw Signal, or whatever it was called, I, like I said, I use the general term Warsaw Signal, even though they changed names a couple of times during the 1840s. Um, Thomas Sharp's writings would show up in other newspapers throughout the country. And, and Dan Jones read this and said, oh, that possibly be, can't be right about the, the Mormons, but I'm really interested. And he meets the missionaries and he learns about the church and he gets baptized. And he comes up to Nauvoo and he meets Joseph Smith and he's a short guy. And Joseph greets him at the, at the pier and shakes his hand and he's short and he says, God bless this little fellow or little man. <laughs> and they become fast friends. Okay. Later on, Dan Jones says, I wish to thank Thomas Sharp and his Warsaw Signal newspaper for introducing me to my church. Okay, so there were some pauses that happened. Dan Jones is at the jail the night before the martyrdom, June 26, 1844. Franklin Worrell says to him, he says, we've worked too hard to get Joseph here. We are never going to let him leave Carthage alive. And if you know what's good for you, what's best for you, you'd better leave too. He said that to Dan Jones. Again, Franklin Morrell, who O.P. Rockwell shot and killed. Dan Jones stays a night with Joseph and Hiram. And, and it's kind of a little bit of an emotional story when you understand why. They're upstairs. It's nightfall. Um, I think they give the bed to Willard. There's one bed in there. Willard Richards is kind of a, a heavier set guy. They give it to him and John Taylor. And... Uh, they're laying on the floor and Joseph offers his arm to Dan for a, a pillow. And they're sitting there talking about life and death and ask if they were ready to die. They suspected that the end might be near. And Dan's like, well, I think I'm ready to die. And Joseph gives his last prophecy. And he gives it to Dan Jones, who was converted because of Thomas Sharp and had just talked to Frank Worrell. And he says, Dan, he says, you will, you will yet see Wells and fulfill the mission appointed to you. He says that that night. The next morning, Dan Jones is at the jail. And Joseph says, I'm not feeling good about things. Will you go and get my attorney down in Quincy? And Dan says, sure, I'll, I'll leave. And so he leaves, goes down the stairs and gets on his horse. And as he leaves, he's shot at by, a, by some anti-Mormon mobster. And he gets so turned around, he actually takes the wrong road out of town, not to Quincy. And he later learns that there was a mob of several hundred people just down the road ready to kill him if he went down to Quincy. He, the mob was on the correct road. Dan got confused and turned around and went down the wrong road and it saved his life. Hmm. And he, otherwise, he would have been killed. Well, the later afternoon, the martyrdom happened. Well, Dan Jones goes on to not only serve one mission in Wales, but two missions. And on his second mission, he converts 2,000 people and brings them back to Utah and becomes a leader in the church. He, he passes away in Utah. So that is the last 
um, prophecy of Joseph Smith. And it almost did come to pass, except Dan Jones got turned around by a gunshot and went down the wrong road and he would have been killed. So it's a phenomenal story. And thanks to the you know, city, thanks Thomas Sharp and his horse, I see them for helping him join the church. <laughs> um, so what I found was really interesting in my research is after the martyrdom, the United States changed significantly and they had the gold rush a few years after of 49, okay? A lot of people in the area left, okay? Um, Thomas Sharp's buried in Carthage. William Grover is buried in Warsaw. Tom, or Aldridge, Mark Aldridge is buried in Tucson, Arizona. And the other two I don't know, but they're not in Warsaw. See, after the trial, Sheriff Backentos made a list of about 120 people or so, give or take, of people who were, he thought were in the mob. And it was a pretty good guess. It's, it's not accurate that he, he listed Sam Fleming, who was, happened to be in Boston at the time. There's some variances, but for the most part, I'd say it's pretty accurate. And I took his list and I went to the Warsaw Cemetery. Actually, at the library, they have a, a, an index of who's buried in the Warsaw Cemetery. And, and at that time, there's this area called the Sixth Section, which most people were buried in. But I went through the whole records, and out of the 150, 200 people were in the mob uh, that was on the, the, the list, 100 and some people on the list from the sheriff, I found only six people on Sheriff Backentos' list that was buried in the Oakland Cemetery in Warsaw. So what that means is that most of the people that probably were in the mob, part of the group, dispersed, they moved west, they moved other places. Only six people are buried, and only one of the five that stood trial is buried in, in Warsaw. He's just got a very small flame grave there. So hmm. I think that's important. Now, after the church left the area, you know, in 46, 47, moved, moved west, um, Warsaw prospered for about 30 years because of these rapids, the lightning, the lightering or the lightning that had to happen. And then in 1877, the government spent $4.5 million at the time and built an eight mile canal on the other side of the river from Keokuk North and it made it so most river boats didn't have to stop anymore at Warsaw. They could just march right up the Mississippi Within a couple decades, the population of Warsaw went from 4,500 down to 2,000. Now imagine a frontier town with houses and buildings and, and stores and hotels for 4,500, and all of a sudden, within a couple decades, you're down to 2,000. You've got a lot of empty real estate. And, and that continued the decline today. There's 1,550 people on the last census. They've got a lot of old, decrepit, broken down buildings, okay? In 1913, today is May 31st, 2019. 106 years ago, this very day, May 31st, 1913, the second biggest engineering project in the world at the time, only behind the Panama Canal, opened just south of Nauvoo, just north of Warsaw, and that's the mighty Keokuk Dam. The Keokuk Dam, most saints don't even know it's there because they're all focused on Nauvoo and Carthage. It's giant, and it was built in 1913, and it had a lock, and that ensured that no ships, if they couldn't fit in the canal before, they had to stop. Now, no ships ever had to stop at Warsaw again. Oh. <laughs> so it was the final nail in the economic coffin for Warsaw because they could go through the lock through the Keokuk Dam and bypass the rapids. The rapids might still be there, but they're submerged. The Sonora quarries that the rock came from for the Carthage Joe got submerged. There's a giant lake on the north side of the uh, the, the dam. It's called Cooper Cooper Lake, and it flooded the area, and, and, and it made Warsaw irrelevant economically with the river traffic. Mm-hmm. In 1962, Keokuk had grown to 17,000 people. Warsaw was at 2,000. For some reason, it was really hard to get to Keokuk. There is a, and this is more of interest. I wrote my book, in, interesting enough, for a general audience. 
I wanted to write to the Mormon audience, like I said, this one chapter, but as I learned about the history before and the history after, this had to be told, if nothing else, for the, for the local population. They may not be quite as interested in the Mormon section, but they're really interested in why their town is decrepit and broken down buildings. Well, the New Road in 1962 cut the time you didn't have to go around to Hamilton anymore. You could go right up the Warsaw Road or the New Road and get to Keokuk. And they thought it was a great thing. It made it so you could get to Keokuk in about 10, 12 minutes. 17,000 people, shopping jobs, whatever. What it did is it had an adverse effect on Warsaw. People would go there to shop in Keokuk. The stores in Warsaw closed down. They had a bigger variety. They had car dealerships in Warsaw. You could, with five cars, they had the oldest Chevy dealer in the nation in Warsaw. But the guy over in Keokuk had 30 cars. So people started going over there. And pretty soon the hotels closed in Warsaw. There's not a hotel there anymore, not, not now. Uh, restaurants closed, car dealerships closed, grocery stores closed. They have um, a small dollar store that just opened. Uh, and that's been, and a Casey's gas station, which is kind of like a maverick in the West. And that's about it. There's, there's one or two. So uh, Warsaw definitely is, is, it's a bedroom community because all the jobs are in Keokuk, but it's, it's, it's a shadow of what it used to be. Wow. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with author Brian Stutzman. Our next conversation will be our last with him, and so the only the people who are newsletter subscribers will be able to hear the final segment of our conversation with Brian. So if you want to hear that, subscribe to our free newsletter at gospeltangents.com newsletter, and I will send you a special link so that you can hear the end of our conversation. We'll talk about Mormons today in Warsaw. Are they treated well or poorly? Meldon was the, the oldest and he was the quarterback on the football team and he was a valedictorian and he was homecoming king and then a few years later his sister Linnell I think it was was the homecoming queen and they were very popular very well loved and very well liked in in Warsaw. What would Thomas Sharp say? <laughs> well Meldon <laughs> leaves on a mission the, probably the first Mormon missionary from Warsaw he goes to I think it's Sweden or Finland if you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.